Almost every day, we see a new headline about robots, artificial intelligence, or autonomous drones. And I don't know about you, but to me, a lot of these headlines paint a rather bleak picture of the future. Some of the popular topics right now have to do with things like killer drones in the military, uh, robots stealing all our jobs, or artificial intelligence growing so smart that humans become extinct. Our research lab works on all these technologies. Collectively, we call them intelligent systems. And my view of the future is far more optimistic, and I hope by the end of this talk, yours is too. As machines become smarter, they're popping up everywhere. In fact, our group has built intelligent systems that work on the ground, they work underwater, they work in the sky, they even work in outer space and cyberspace. But today, I'm going to talk about one of the areas where we are the most passionate, and that's in health. And more specifically, functional restoration. Functional restoration involves creating assistive technologies to help people do things they can no longer do, or maybe they could no, never do it in the first place. This might be the result of an injury, a degenerative disease, or you know, simply just old age. It can apply to physical movement, like a robotic exoskeleton to help a paralyzed person walk, or it can apply to sensory functions, like a cochlear implant to help a deaf person hear. And a little over a month ago, when we were thinking about what would be the best way to showcase the power of intelligent systems on functional restoration, the technical team came to me and said they wanted to do a live technology demonstration. Uh, so I, I said, uh, let me get this straight. You want to do a technology demonstration of a system that we need to build in six weeks, and you want to do it live in front of almost 1,000 people. And they said, no, we want you to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I must be crazy, because I agreed, and we started designing a system to help people with muscular diseases perform activities of daily living. And now I'd like to share that system with you by inviting our teammate, Glenn, to join me. <laughs> Glenn was born with a form of muscular dystrophy called Duchenne's disease. And uh, one of the first things we did was brainstorm with Glenn on how we could use a system like this to show more independence. Things like combing his hair, or popping popcorn in a microwave, or even shaving. Although, we never quite got Glenn to agree to try shaving with his robot arm. <laughs> <laughs> in the end, we decided on brewing coffee. And that's what Glenn's going to show for you today. As he does that, I'm going to explain a few of the technical challenges that we had to overcome in building this system. The first one is the interface. An interface is a way for humans and machines to share information. There's a lot of different ways you could do that. We selected augmented reality. Augmented reality is a relatively new technology. Chill pads. And it's represented in this visor that Glenn's wearing. And up on the big screen, you can see what Glenn sees. And if you've ever seen a system like this before, a robot arm connected to a wheelchair, pretty much every single one of those systems, the robot arm is remote controlled. And Glenn can do that as well through this interface. The little green triangles that you see control the arm. And when Glenn stares at the triangles, the arm moves. So he can do things like wave to you right now. And then through his visor, he can see when you wave back. <laughs> Now, as you can see, controlling the arm in this manner requires quite a bit of effort and skill, especially if you're performing fine motor tasks, like operating a coffee maker. What we'd prefer is just to have Glenn be able to say, brew me a cup of coffee, and then the arm would go and brew the coffee for him. And in fact, that's exactly the capability that we built in 
to this system, and Glenn's going to show it to you now. High pass, control mode, drive mode. Driving mode. In order to do this, we had to add a lot of intelligence into this system. The first area was in machine perception. Perception is the machine's ability to see and understand the real world. There's a camera above Glenn's left shoulder, and we use that camera to teach the machine what a coffee maker looks like. Now, as Glenn drives around, anytime the machine sees an object that it recognizes, it puts a red ball on it in his view. This lets Glenn know that the machine knows what this object is. When Glenn stares at that ball, it turns green. This is an indication to the machine that Glenn is interested in that object. And the machine starts to infer, why is Glenn interested in the coffee maker? <laughs> he pops up, the machine pops up three options. Maybe Glenn wants to clean the co coffee maker. Maybe he wants to make tea. Or maybe he wants to brew coffee. When Glenn stares at the brew coffee menu item, it turns green, indicating to the machine that, Glenn intent, that Glenn's intent is to brew coffee. Now the machine has to figure out how to actually brew the coffee. In this case, there's two steps. Shut the lid and push the on button. Once it's determined the steps, it needs to calculate how to move the arm in order to perform those steps. If it wanted to pick up an object, it would want the gripper open right above the object. If it wants to push a button, like it does in this case, it wants the gripper closed and placed right on top of the button. You can see that the robot arm successfully uh, performed a task, and we have coffee brewing. Which brings me back to why are we brewing coffee in the first place? When we were talking to Glenn about ideas for how he could use a system like this to show more independence. Glenn said, you know guys, all these ideas are great, but I've had people helping me perform these tasks my whole life. If I could do anything up on that stage, I would want to do something to show my gratitude and my appreciation for those people. People like my mom, who's helped me my whole life, countless hours, driving me places, helping me get dressed, preparing me meals. And we dove into that a little bit with Glenn, and we discovered that one of his favorite activities is drinking coffee with his mom. So, Glenn's mom, Theresa, come on out. <laughs> and then, You know, we often think the objective of a system like this is to increase a person's independence. But I'm starting to believe that the true goal might to be to increase the person's level of interdependence. Give them the ability to do things for other people. After all, isn't that when we feel our best when we're helping others? And this is just the beginning. Think about a system like this with two arms on it. And think about those systems helping people like Glenn, or wounded warriors, or our grandmothers prepare a dinner party for their loved ones. I can already see them grabbing ingredients off the shelves in a grocery store, uh, lowering a turkey into an oven, and when the meal's all over, slicing that apple pie for dessert. Now that is the future that I imagine when I think about intelligent systems. Thank you.